spending my day interviewing one young black man after another who called a hotline with disturbing stories of discrimination and sometimes brutality by the police. And this young man walks in my office with a stack of papers about this thing. He had taken detailed notes of his encounters with the police over about a nine month period of time. He had names, dates, witnesses, some cases even badge numbers, uh, narrative descriptions of various encounters he had with the, with the police. Just an extraordinary amount of detail regarding this pattern of police stops that were occurring in his neighborhood and affecting him. And I was just blown away by the amount of detail and the amount of corroborating evidence. And to top it off, he was a good looking young man. He was charismatic, well spoken, and I thought, here's my dream plaintiff. Here's the one we've been waiting for. Uh, the public will relate to him and understand why the practices of the Oakland Police Department have got to stop once for all in his community. And as we're talking, I'm getting more excited, and then he says something that causes me to pause. And I go, what? what did you just say? What, did you just say you're, you're a drug felon? We had actually been screening people for criminal records. People called the hotline, we'd send a form out. They had to fill out asking them a number of questions about their experiences with the police and their background. And one of the questions was, have you ever been convicted of a felony? And we had been screening people because we felt that we couldn't represent someone with a criminal record in a racial profiling case because if we did, law enforcement and the media would argue, well, of course the police should be keeping their eye on him. He's a felon. And we knew if we put him on the stand, Somebody with a criminal record on the stand, he would be cross-examined about their criminal history and all the attention would be on their past rather than on the practices of the police and his credibility might be, you know, destroyed in front of a jury. So we had been screening people with prior criminal records and representing lawyers and teachers and veterans of the Iraq War and people who had squeaky clean records and who everyone would understand was like them only harassed by the police. And so I said, you're, you're a drug felon? I am sorry, I'm sorry. We're not going to be able to represent you. I'm just, I'm so sorry. There's no way we could possibly take your case. And I try to explain the reasons why. And he becomes agitated. He says, no, but you don't understand. I was, I was innocent. I was, I was framed. The police planted drugs on me, and they beat up me and my friend. And he starts telling me this big story about how he was framed, and the police set him up. And I just, I just stop listening. I'm, I'm sorry. I am so sorry, but I just can't help you. There's just nothing that I can do. And as he's talking, he gets more and more frustrated, more and more enraged. And then he begins to yell at me. And he says to me, you're no better than the police. You're no better than the police. The minute I tell you I'm a felon, you just stop listening. You can't even hear what I have to say. Now, what's to become of me? What's to become of me? I can't get a job anywhere. I got nowhere to go. I'm sleeping in my grandma's basement because nowhere will take me in. I can't even feed myself. I can't even get food stamps. But what's to be kind of me? How am I supposed to feed myself? How am I supposed to take care of myself as a man? He says, good luck finding one young black man in my neighborhood. They haven't got to already. They've got to us already. And he snatches those papers off the desk and out of my hands and just starts ripping them up rolling him in the air. It's just snowing paper in the air. And he turns around, walking out, yelling, you're no better than police. I can't believe I trusted you. Well, several months after that, I was in his neighborhood doing a public access television show um, that was broadcasting live from his neighborhood. At that time, we were actually holding town hall meetings up and down the state in California, urging people to protest then Governor Davis's refusal to sign racial profiling legislation. And so that day, uh, I was doing this public access television show broadcast live, trying to urge thousands of people to get on buses and go to the state capitol to protest uh, the governor's refusal to address racial profiling in the state. So the show concludes, the live show concludes, and the minute it's over, he busts in the door the studio door carrying this dirty potted plant. And he rushes up to me 
and he's emotional, in fact, on the verge of tears, and he thrusts this plant into my arms, and he says, I'm just here to tell you I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the way I treated you. I shouldn't treat you like should have treated you that way. I see you out here trying to work for our people, and I shouldn't I should have done that. I'm just here to tell you I'm sorry. I would have bought you some flowers, but I still don't have a job. I snatched this plant from my grandma's front porch here. <laughs> and he just thrusts it in my arms and turns around and runs out the building. I turn I chase after him. He jumps into this broke down car that was waiting for him, and they take off. Well, several months after that, I'm in my office, open the newspaper. What's on the front page? The Oakland Riders police scandal is broke. Turns out that a gang of police officers, otherwise known as a drug task force, had been planting drugs on suspects, beating folks up, and who's identified as one of the main officers accused of planting drugs on people and beating folks up? The officer he had identified to me as having planted drugs on him and beat up him and his friends. And it was only then that the light bulb finally began to go on for me. And I thought to myself, you know what? He's right about me. I'm no better than the police. The minute he told me he was a felon, stopped listening. Could not hear what he had to say. And I came to realize that my real crime wasn't in refusing to represent an innocent man. My real crime was in failing to allow the stories of the millions of those we view as guilty from ever being heard. It was a failure to really care about those we've written off as the bad ones. The millions of folks who even civil rights lawyers like me, people who claim to care, won't even touch. And I started asking myself, why is it that we haven't been able to find one young black man in his neighborhood they haven't got to yet? What is really going on here? And that began my journey of asking myself some hard questions about how am I, as a civil rights lawyer, actually replicating many of the forms of discrimination and exclusion and marginalization I'm supposedly fighting against. But it also set me on a quest to really understand what is happening in these communities. And what I learned in that process truly blew my mind.